thanks, Melanie, for sponsoring this and to Chinese American Citizens Alliance and, of course, the Veterans Recognition Project for hosting the event during Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Well, today is a rare occurrence, first Saturday even, that we have convened in our Zoom studio, our own military model minority of over 215 years of dedication and experience in service to our country. These are the post-World War II generation who joined in relative anonymity and made this, life, made this their life's career. And may, many still may encounter the challenges of advancement. Well, you know, when Chinese parents of any generation talk about a career, it's usually something STEM, right? It's science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, actually it's science, engineering, technology, science, technology, engineering, and money. And non-traditional careers were things like acting, dance, music, maybe teaching. But today's group that we're gonna hear from is another non-traditional career for us, science, technology, engineering, and military. And as we listen to each of their conversations with us today, I hope you'll take some, what they say. And if you are a descendant of a Chinese American World War II veteran or know of one, I want you to make some mental comparisons of what your veteran may have shared with you about their experiences during World War II and after, and what you hear our panelists say, and hope you'll understand where they were and where we are today. Well, there's no better person to start this off than the topic that he's chosen to give a title to, and it's taking charge. If there's anyone that I know that's taken charge of things like the Chinese American World II Veterans Recognition Project effort toward the Congressional Gold Medal, it is Major General William S. Chen, U.S. Army. Bill was in Army acquisitions and served on active duty for 32 years, primarily in missile and missile acquisitions. He served as a commanding general, U.S. Army Missile Command and Program Executive Officer, and of course, he's been in private industry as well. Bill has been a real force in why the Congressional Gold Medal bills were passed. If there's a person I would say holds people accountable, it is Major General Bill Chen. I want to thank him, first of all, for all of his leadership. Without much of that, you know, if he were not kicking me and others in the you-know-where, we probably would not have this bill passed today. So Major General Chen, let's take charge. You, can, you take charge today. Up to you. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, but really, it was a team effort to get the passage of the Congressional Gold Medal. Now, I've had a number of challenges in my 32-year career. I'd like to talk about one such challenge. By means of background, aside from overseas assignments in Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos, and my battalion command tour, most of my assignments have been in weapon systems development and acquisition. In June of 1984, I had served two years as a Colonel Program Manager of the Chaparral Air Defense Missile System, a short range air defense missile. I then got a phone call from my three-star general boss asking me to take over a troubled program called the Division Air Defense Gun System, a short range air defense gun. The three-star told me that he had to replace the Brigadier General in charge of the troubled program. And this program had bad press in the New York, New York Times, Washington Post, and on national TV, reporting on the system's radar, having problems in tracking targets in a severe electronic jamming environment. Congress and the Secretary of Defense had major concerns on this program. So whoever took over the program would face major challenges. One, the Army needed to comply with congressional direction to conduct a force-on-force -force operational evaluation of the system. And two, the program was at risk because Congress withheld procurement funds pending the conduct of this operational evaluation. So it behooved the program manager to get the operational evaluation completed as soon as possible. Despite these challenges, when the three-star asked me to take over this program, I said yes without hesitation. I was well aware of the real possibility of failure. That was risk, but where there's risk, there are opportunities. When I took over, I quickly assessed the biggest issue was that the Army had no funding for the operational evaluation. I decided to take on this issue even though it wasn't my responsibility. Then I got a phone call from my three-star boss to meet him at Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso, because the Army Air Defense Center 
was hosting the air defense review for a four-star general, the vice chief of staff army. I immediately asked my boss to set up a private early morning meeting for me to talk to the vice chief of staff army on funding for the operational evaluation. But that private meeting never happened. Why? Because all the generals were invited to a breakfast session and I wasn't. The air defense review went through almost a whole day. Nobody mentioned the operational evaluation, even though that had major impact on the air defense force. Suddenly at three o'clock, the four-star general says he has to go. But he turns around to the audience and says, Billy, what have you got? Here it is, I wanted to have a private conversation with this three-star general, and now I'm on the spot to address him in front of the whole audience. As I walked up to the front of the room where the generals were, I said to myself, it's time for me to give an elevator speech. I looked directly at the four star and said, sir, I need your help for the congressionally directed operational evaluation. We have no funding, no test plan, no unit designated for the test and no test range. That's all I said, because I knew the four star would take action on this. He turns to the ranking three star in the room and says, where are we on this? The three star then talked about $75 million required for the test. They had it in the R&D and procurement appropriation, but these funds had to be programmed into the operations maintenance appropriation and it would take time. The four star stands up and says, fix it. And then he walks out. And so sure enough, that got the ball rolling. The army got the funding to do the operational evaluation and everything else fell in place. After this air defense review, I was on a flight to Dallas, Texas. As I boarded my flight and passed through the first class cabin, I see three generals from the meeting. And they say, they see me, they're all smiling. In fact, I had previously worked for all three of them, so they knew me. They didn't say a word, but one of them gave me a thumbs up they knew I got what I needed by going to the Vice Chief of Staff Army and that I'd done the right thing. Next, leading up to the briefing to the Secretary of Defense, I had to do pre-briefs all the way up to the Chief of Staff Army and the Under Secretary of the Army. I finished my briefing to the Chief of Staff and sat down. He then looked at me and said, see me after the meeting. The generals went on with their discussion and I started to wonder, what did the chief want me for? What did I do that I didn't do right? You know, why did he really want to talk to me? When the meeting was over, the chief came over to me and said, the day after tomorrow, the new Brigadier General's list is coming out and you're on it, congratulations. Wow, that was great news, but I couldn't tell anybody except my wife until the list was announced. To cut a long story short, the operational evaluation was conducted. The system met the contract specification level for the electronic jamming threat, which was good news for me as a program manager. But the system couldn't handle the advanced jamming threat. And as a gun system, it didn't have the capability against jinking maneuvering aircraft. So the Secretary of Defense decided to terminate the program. Here's the epilogue. I got promoted to Brigadier General, then Major General, and for my four-star command, the former commander of the Operational Test and Evaluation Agency who led the conduct of the operational evaluation became my four-star boss. So what are the lessons learned? Number one, at times, in what we do, we have to step out of our lanes to accomplish the mission. In this situation, I took the risk of going outside the chain of command to the vice chief to get the funding for the operational evaluation. Number two, I could have easily had an adversarial relationship with the two-star commander of the operational test and evaluation agency. The lesson learned is 
we must always establish and maintain good relationships in whatever we do and do not burn any bridges behind you. Who could have known years later that he would have been my boss? Number three, I had been handpicked by this three-star and four-star to take on this Brigadier General's position. I previously worked for both of them. The lesson learned is when bosses have confidence and trust in you, take on the challenges they offer, continue to demonstrate your capabilities to handle tough situations and the rewards will come. Celebrate AAPI Heritage Month. How does this all relate? Keep in mind, the time frame of the above was the mid 1980s. In those days, the words diversity and inclusion weren't in our vocabulary. The three star and four star generals in selecting me to fill in for this Brigadier General's position did so based upon the assessment that I was best qualified to fill that position. They were colorblind. They selected me based on demonstrated performance and potential, and I just happened to be an AAPI. So I would encourage AAPIs to take charge of your tasks and responsibilities, respond to the challenges you face, have faith and confidence in the merit-based system of our armed forces or wherever you work, and you'll be recognized and rewarded based upon your demonstrated performance and potential. Ed, back to you. Thank you, Bill, for those wise words, and I've really learned much from you. So let me just ask, add to that that you've done a wonderful job in leading all of us who have been civilians uh, for the last several years in this project. So thank you again for your service and your example. Another gentleman that I really uh, have embraced in terms of what he's meant to our committee and what he's meant to our project in securing the Congressional Gold Medal is Major General Robert G.F. Lee, also U.S. Army. When he talks about the World War II veterans and how they impacted his career, I think most of you who are descendants will want to listen to what Bob has to say. He served as infantry officer on active duty reserves and National Guard for 39 years. I believe you're the longest serving of all the ones that have retired. Honored to have served with the 100th Battalion, the 442nd Infantry Regiment. It is the Army's most decorated unit from the time he started as a second lieutenant to, his, to its CO. He commanded the Army and Army National Guard and is responsible for Homeland Security, Emergency Management, and Veteran Affairs. Bob, thank you so much for your wisdom and your guidance throughout this project. Bob, tell us how the World War II veterans impacted your career. Thank you, Ed. And uh, aloha to all from the state of Hawaii, uh, which is uh, where I am uh, in talking to you all today. And just want to make a slight correction. Yeah, 39 years, I'm pretty old and served a long time, but my good friend, uh, Daryl Wong, uh, served 40 plus years. So we've got a couple of old codgers here. And uh, but uh, we're happy to uh, join join this session. And the reason why I chose the topic, uh, how World War II veterans uh, impacted my career, because we're really honoring uh, that generation uh, today, primarily the, the Chinese American uh, World War II veterans. But uh, back when I started, we were just leaving the Vietnam War. The army was certainly not the most popular place to be. So I just had it, I had it fixed in my mind that I would serve my six year obligation and be gone and uh, try to become a, a good engineer like Ed Gore. <laughs> but uh, little did I realize that the army assigned me to a unit that would uh, change my mind. And uh, as uh, as, as Ed said, this was the 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry, a segregated unit of Asian Americans, primarily Japanese Americans, that were not allowed to serve initially. In fact, those in the service were mustered out because they were known as enemy aliens after December 7th, 1941. So I had to learn what this these soldiers of small stature, but uh, extremely, being extremely tough, uh, what they had to go through because they really had a lot to prove 
because many of their families were in internment camps in the mainland United States. So, <clears throat> so these soldiers, once they were set to combat, had to prove that they were the best and they gave it all their, they gave it all. And uh, initially were known as the Purple Heart Unit because they received so many casualties, but they did accomplish every mission assigned, even at great cost. So the, the highlight of this unit that we all remember is that out of the 10 battles in the United States Army, this unit fought in one of them, in rescuing a battalion from the Texas National Guard in the US Army, surrounded by Germans, and their own units, army units, could not get them out. So they had to move this regiment from Italy to France, and they, yes, at great cost, they did defeat the Germans and rescue the, the, the soldiers from Texas. So they rescued about 250 soldiers, but at the cost of 800 of their own men. And uh, so that for that epic battle, they stand as one of the top 10 battles in the entire history of the United States Army. I was so lucky in my earlier years to have been with so many of them. Now, that regiment surely had uh, two famous uh, soldiers that became United States senators. Spark Matsunaga and Daniel Inoue, but it was the countless combat veterans, sergeants that were the backbone of the unit. And in 2000, as just as we're finding out today, reviewing the records of the uh, Chinese American veterans, that uh, Chinese Americans and Asians in general were not recognized for combat awards. But in, in the year 2000, the army did and upgraded 20 soldiers to the Medal of Honor. So for a regiment to receive 21 Medals of Honor, I know of no other regiment that has uh, that many. So, but the earlier picture that was, that was shown, uh, truly an honor to have uh, been associated with Barney Hajiro, George Sakato, and <coughs> Shizuya Hayashi, just regular folks that you would meet on the street and not recognize that they were Medal of Honor recipients. Sadly, none of the Medal of Honor recipients of the regiment are alive today. Today, the Army is really composed of uh, soldiers that reflect society. So we started with a segregated unit and today's unit that, are, uh, that were <clears throat> sent to Iraq twice as a unit to uh, fight for the United States Army. Sure, we have Asian Americans, but we have a lot more Pacific Islanders. We have two companies of Samoans from American Samoa, and uh, none of the enemy in Iraq wanted to take on the Samoans and a company of Chamorros from Guam and Saipan. In this picture, I ran across this soldier in Kalat, Afghanistan. He's not Asian American but he was just so proud to be part of this unit. He tattooed the patch permanently so all would know that he's a gopher broke and a soldier from the 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry. So what I wanted to say that in the armed forces of the United States, no matter your racial background, your performance as a soldier or service member is, must be at the highest standards. And uh, for, for our soldiers, we had an extra challenge. We had to be the best because we didn't want to let these 442 veterans down. So it was certainly an honor to work on this project, recognizing Chinese American World War II veterans with the Congressional Gold Medal. In our review, we found that so many Chinese Americans served with distinction and especially like the Japanese Americans and the Filipino Americans. This was during a period when the Chinese Americans in World War II the, in the greater society were not first-class citizens back home. Yet they answered the call and fought for America. So I'm sure with my colleagues, it's a real honor to be on the same panel 
with uh, World War II veteran, Army Corps navigator Art Shack, because I found out working with the Japanese Americans, the Filipino Americans, Chinese Americans, that this generation was cut from the same mold. They all blazed the trail that allowed myself and those on the panel at least to grow up in the United States Army with no discrimination. If you do your best, you will be promoted to levels commensurate with the, the merit show. So in closing, I would like to encourage young Americans watching this program to try the military. I'm not, I'm not asking you to make it a career, but even a couple of years of service the values that are instilled in you and the friendships that you make will be a lifetime. And for those of you that are serving, please stay in and continue to serve because the generals and the admiral on this panel, we're all retired. We need you to take our place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate your comments. And I certainly want to encourage those of you who are even considering life in the military to look at the examples that you see on this panel today and take from them what you can, because they're here to help. They're here to serve because they've done their service. They want to see that you do yours as well if you decide to go that route. You know, I convinced a lot of people to tune in today because I told them Shaq was going to be on, on the program. He's going to be a panelist. And so certainly said, yeah, I want to hear Shaq. And so here it is. We have Arthur T. Sh T. S. Shaq. And, and, and so I just want to let you know that all the things that Arthur Shaq has done in his life, if you want to think about being promoted on the base of merit, Art Shaq should be the secretary of the army today. But here it is. We are today where Shaq is. And Arthur Shaq is a navigator, a B-24 heavy bomber, guardian angel. On December 7, 1941, the, this carefree lifestyle for Art ended. He joined the Army Air Corps and was commissioned as a bombardier and navigator. He brings new meaning to the words, bombs away. Art flew 51 combat missions over Germany, Italy, France, and Romania. Yet, and after VE, he served as a C-47 navigator flying between Guam, Saipan, and, and Tinian. Art was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters, and many other medals for Europe and Pacific. He used the GI Bill and obtained a civil engineering degree from Purdue University. When we say that Shaq is in the house, there is only one on the islands, and that's Art Shaq. When we think about a 97-year-old with a handicap, we're talking about his golf game. Golf pros say that as you get older, if you can shoot your age, that's phenomenal. Art, can you and I trade places? Because I'd be happy to shoot a 97 because I know you can shoot a 71. Art, how did World War II affect your life? Well, thank you. I'm so impressed with so much drink here with me. <laughs> and I think I can claim one thing. I'm older than all of them. So, okay, so my topic is, how has World War II changed my life? Well, I thought of two words very significantly and very thoroughly. I thought it was great just getting out of high school in 1941 in Kauai High School in Bihui, Kauai. I thought that memory would last me a long time. But what do you know? Less than six months later, I was at Pearl Harbor on the day of infamy. And that supersedes anything I've ever seen since then and after then. So that was Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And that was the start of World War II. Uh, soon after high school, I left Kapaw, Kauai, my hometown, and moved over to Honolulu with full intentions of attending the University of Hawaii and get an education. But no, that was not to be. Instead of attending the University of Hawaii, I got a job with a Navy contractor at Pearl Harbor. 
they paid me 75 cents an hour and I was a good worker. So soon after I got 90 cents an hour and that was great in those days. So that's how I ended up at Pearl Harbor and was there at the Bay of Infamy. While there, while working there, I had a fellow uh, stock clerk, which was my job. And he came up to me and said, hey, Art, I just found out about the Army Air Corps. They're looking for aviation cadets. And he, was, he told me he's going to sign up. And why don't I look into it? So I did just that. I looked into it. I liked what I saw. And I said, OK, I'm going to sign up. And here I am at age 19, and not less than two years out of high school, sitting at Hickam Field as a brand new aviation cadet. I remember my first job. Uh, we were, while waiting for assignment to the mainland, we were working for the post office. Um, our first job was carrying mail bags. And that was fun, although it was Hard work for me. But the uh, Army Air Corps moved fast. The aviation cadet program didn't waste any time. For me at first, sent me to Santa Ana Air Force Base for pre-flight training. From there, I went to Victorville Air Force Base for bombardier training. Somewhere then at age 20, I was commissioned as second lieutenant. Then after Victorville, sent to Mesa Field in Sacramento. And there we got navigation trained. And in my weekend time, I hitchhiked from Sacramento to San Francisco and enjoyed myself. Then after all that training I was assigned to what I was really trained for, a B-24, Heavy Bombardment Group. That group had additional training at places like Harvard, Nebraska Air Base, uh, Gowan Field, Boise, Idaho Air Base. After some group training, group flying, uh, that group was then assigned to Europe to do what they were trained for. Uh, to get to Europe, we ended up in Italy, in the middle of Italy. And we got there by leaving continental United States, flying to Brazil, then across the Atlantic, over nearby Ascension Island in place. We got troubles over the waters. Of course, we made it safely to Dakar. And from Dakar, we then went to Tunisia or someplace, Marrakesh, Tunisia. And then to Italy, which was uh, the base for the group. From Italy, we flew many missions, target missions, to different countries such as Italy, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Romania, and a few others. And I was very fortunate. There you see a picture of our crew. There's 11 the crew because uh, there are two co-pilots. One for the co-pilot was promoted to be first pilot. But anyway, that's our group. And we flew 51 missions. And I said uh, that I was very fortunate. My whole 51 mission was spent with the same group shown in this picture here. And we left our home base on mission. Some were routine, some were a little scary, and some were very scary. And to counter that, we had a few milk runs. And we took off early in the morning, went to the target, and got back to our home base successfully. Almost every mission except one. And on that one, the target was Cloesti. Uh, some of you may have heard of OSD. Uh We got shot up pretty bad and all hell broke loose. Uh, when one thing goes wrong, more than one thing happens in succession as 
uh, some of you might know. In addition to having holes all over the plane you know, from clack, not bullet from clack, um, a few lines were punctured and gas was leaking and creating fumes throughout the plane. And with those fumes, the pilot had to keep the bomb bay doors open to keep those fumes from being very dangerous as small spark from an engine to blow up us, blow us up sky high. In addition, there was a 500 pound bomb hung in its shackle. It wouldn't release. And in addition to that, there were two engines that were damaged so bad they had to be feathered. But we had a very skillful pilot and he somehow miraculously flew us low level flight, leaving us group protection, low level heading back for Italy. We knew we couldn't make it, but off the coast of Italy. And before that we were fired upon from more machine guns or anti-aircraft fire from low level. Fortunately, our pilot did some evasive action, got to it, spotted an airfield off the coast of Yugoslavia on the island of Vis, and made a one pass run. Uh, there was no second chance because of fuel conditions. Made a one pass run and made a very successful landing, meaning we all got out of it okay. So thank the good Lord, there was a guardian angel plane. And when they checked the fuel after we landed, the tanks were found to be dry. So that was something I will remember the rest of my life. And after doing our 51 missions, we were all sent home for rest and recreation and reassignment. When I got home to Hawaii, my dad was very proud of me, I guess. And he gave me one big blue owl party. And that was something also I will always remember results of World War II. That after the blue owl was reassigned to a troop carrier squadron at Bellafield, Waimanalo, Hawaii. And from there, we flew to the Marianas back and forth and touching bases with at some one time or other. Palmyra Island, Johnson Island, Midway Island, Wake Island, uh, Majuro, and we talk. And uh, then to the Mariana, Guam and Kenyan and Saipan. And another recollection of something I will always remember, we took off from the Marianas one airport one day in August, 1945. And on the same day, the Enola Gay took off for Hiroshima. So in my mind, I can relate this way. I saw the beginning of World War II. I was at Pearl Harbor on that day of infamy, 1941, December 7th. And I saw the end of World War II by taking off from the same airport that the uh, Inola Gate took off for Hiroshima in August 1945. So that's what I remember on the last flight that I did as a member of the United States Army Air Corps. Then with the war ending, did I get any more benefits from World War II? Well, there was a GI Bill. And with the GI Bill, in the mid 1940s, I was able to attend Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana, and uh, spent five day, five years there, earning two degrees in civil engineering, and also got married, and got a son, born in Indiana. So I have a son, uh, an Indiana Hoosier. Then there's a picture of my my wife and. Pam's Pam's mother. We got married in 1948. Nine months later, our son came by, Milton. <laughs> so we left Purdue in 1951. Uh, 
turning down job offers from California and Marlin and went back home. And uh, at home, we were, in those days with my background, with my education, uh, I was able to find jobs, good jobs, with the state of Hawaii, the Hawaiian Electric, Coast Guard, Army, Navy, and some other private practice, having my own practice too. So that's what happened to me with World War II. And I can say in conclusion, uh, did it help my, my life? Did it change my life? I say absolutely, and no question about it. And uh, do I have any advice for youngsters or anybody who's younger than me? <laughs> when you have a problem, just think of what's best for it and just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, First Lieutenant Art Shack, for your story. And I want to just ask our audience out there to give him a round of applause. Well, Major General Daryl Wong, you have a tough act to follow right there. I can see that right now. It's going to be difficult, but we'll, we'll manage it through. I don't know how many of you remember when you were growing up, you played with these little green toy soldiers. So you ordered them through the comic book, and about six weeks later, when Amazon wasn't around, we got those six weeks later, we got those little infantry soldiers, and that's all we had. Now, those are the guys that joined Bob and Bill at the Army. Daryl was a smarter guy. He ordered, he ordered the little green airplanes for himself. And so some people talk about cars they drive. Major General Daryl D.M. Wong, U.S. Air Force retired, talks about the planes he's flown during Vietnam and Kosovo. Daryl flew the C-141A on active duty during Vietnam and then the KC-135R with the Hawaii National, Air National Guard during the Kosovo War. He retired with 40 years of service in the United States Air Force. And Daryl, you look really good for a guy that's uh, 52, right? You joined, you joined him in a really young age. But you command the Hawaii Army and the Air National Guard. You're responsible for Homeland Security and head of emergency management and veterans affairs. He is the one guy that has the non-traditional military career of being a pilot. Daryl, tell us how you walked in the footsteps of the World War II veterans. So yeah, our, uh, we have the utmost respect for Art. Bob and I are lucky enough to uh, chase uh, Shaq all, all over the golf course. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Art. Um, I'll give you a little context. You know, what, what I'll talk about is probably a little different from all the other ones. Uh, I think the important thing is, you know, why did I join the military and why do I talk about in the footsteps of our veterans? You know, I entered uh, Viet the Vietnam War and everyone probably that is old enough will understand it was not a popular war. It was hard to get a date for some of us that had short hair. Uh, none, of the, none of the young girls would want to go out with us. Um, there was a lot of protests in the communities as well as college. There's a lot of morals, moral decisions to be made. Some of my, by all my peers, I've had fraternity brothers who went to Canada to, to get out of the military. For myself, I, I knew I had to go in the military. It, it was just the right thing to do. But understanding that what I chose coming out of flight school would be an aircraft that did not shoot or drop any ordinance. It would hopefully bring good uh, during the time of war. So it was a rude awakening for someone who came from a very conservative Catholic high school. Uh, you know, the destruction of war in a countryside, and the disruption of people's lives in that country, and even the countries that support the war is something that, you know, the American people don't normally see. It's not what CNN shows you. Um, some of the other things, you know, I experienced as a young lieutenant is carrying bodies home, and then you also are carrying injured, um, injured uh, soldiers home. I mean, you care for them and you respect them because they gave their last measure to protect the homeland that they, that, that they wanted to protect. The other thing that a lot of people don't hear or see is I saw a lot of crying women on fences. When our USGIs left Vietnam and Thailand, their promise to their women that they had uh, stayed with 
Um, they weren't bringing them home. And these women were, were going to get prejudiced by the Vietnamese as well as the Thais in that country. And then came the, the baby airlift, we brought home the POWs as well as the um, uh, uh, refugee airlift. So we brought a lot of people into the United States uh, that may be prejudiced into the future, but it was the right thing to do, I thought. So when I talk about the footsteps of our veterans, you know, in, from the beginning of time, our citizens defended the homeland. So what do you call the homeland? Is that the country that you're born in? So is it a, the adopted home or the community that you live in or the family that you support? I think it's all of the above. And for the servicemen uh, like uh, Bob and, and, and KK and Susie and all the other ones on this call, it is those that you fight shoulder to shoulder with in combat. If you go back in time, the Minutemen uh, were farmers by day with rifles at the door, a communities in danger, they picked up their rifles, left their families to defend it. In the case of our Chinese American veterans who are heroes in our eyes, who were not citizens of the United States, some of them, nor could some of them be citizens, joined the military to fight for their homeland. In, in some of the video, you, you saw Wa Kao Kong. Wa Kao Kong was a very smart chemical engineer. He did not have to go to combat, but he, he wanted to join. And he joined, and because his scores were so high and his flying ability was so good, they could not deny him a fighter fighter pilot uh, slot. So he was one of the first Chinese fighter pilots. And those that is in one of the footsteps that I would like to, con that I continued in because Wa Kao Kong came from Hawaii and he came from the University, University of Hawaii. The Chinese at the time, like I said, could not be, the, be citizens, but in the Asian culture, family is most important. Respect and defending uh, your family is important. You fight to defend the country that you call your homeland. You fight to defend your family so that no one else needs to go in your place. And then you fight to protect those you go to war with. And as I was asked to reflect and why I stayed in the military is, and here is some of the difficult decisions. And these are probably more basic than very strategic decisions. As a young pilot, it's your crew, ensuring that everyone in your crew is safe and that if there is any danger in your airplane, you are gonna be the last to leave if you're the aircraft commander. As you move up in rank and you take care of a squadron, it's your squadron and their families. You wanna make sure that whoever you send the war, their families will be taken care of when they do come home or when they don't come home. Then as I commanded the National Guard right after Bob Lee, it is the question, this was during the, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, did we prepare them well enough? Do we have the right things in place to take care of their families when they come home? Do we have the right things in place to take care of all these veterans coming home that were injured? Because during that war, because of the ability for us to bring people home quickly, you had a lot of veterans that were injured that would not have been injured in other wars. So these are some of the decisions that you as a senior leader had to make. Are you, did you prepare them well enough? The other thing was there were a lot of suicides and it's something that you as a leader and everyone on this panel, you never wanna to go to someone's family to tell them that their loved one is not gonna return. So those are very tough decisions of any leaders. These are not strategic decisions, even though they are at some point, but the bottom line, these are the decisions of the families, of the people that you're going to have to finally talk to uh, at the end of this war. And why did I stay in the military? And why did I talk about following in the footsteps of our veterans? Like all our veterans, uh, our Chinese World War II veterans, they are the ones that we follow. The Arthur Shacks, the Wakao Kongs, uh, all, the, all these veterans, they, many came home and left their service to become statesmen, to lead in their communities, to lead in, other, in their service and to help make their communities better. For myself, I left after active duty after the Vietnam War and joined the Hawaii National Guard to continue to serve the island home that raised me. The National Guard 
is organized and trained to take everything they learn for a contingency and quickly adapt to it, to help the state and community in time of a natural disaster or man-made disaster. Why I say that is as I, my mother never thought I'd come home after I left Honolulu. I was a very Kalohi kid. Uh, when I flew all over the world, I finally realized Hawaii's not so bad after all. So I did come home. And when I came home, I understood that I had to give back to the community that raised me. So for myself, I think all the veterans we have on this call today is to follow in the footsteps of those that came before us. Become statesmen in our own ways and use all that we learn in the military to help our communities. In ending this term that was ingrained in me as a youth in school, noblesse oblige, too much is given, much is expected. All the veterans on this call, they have been given much and given a lot. It is now our turn to give back to the community, the state and the country that raised us and that we all call home. This is what veterans like Senator Akaka, Senator Hiram Fong, Arthur Shack, and all Chinese American veterans who left to fight for their adopted country, their homeland, and came home for those who are able to come home and give back and help tend to this country even more. And a lot of people asked about what advice would you give these young kids nowadays? What I told uh, a lot of the young kids that asked me about that, the song, love the one you're with, whatever, whatever job you're given, do it to the best of your ability. And once you do that, you'll be recognized and you move higher. Uh, the international experience, the leadership experience that I had uh, really helped me follow on to work for another company. So this other company looked and asked me to work for them when I retired. So again, the value that you're gonna learn from everything that you do is, is important. So again, Ed, thank you for your uh, leadership in this thing and allowing us this small opportunity to thank all our Chinese World War II veterans, our true heroes. Mahalo, Daryl. Thank you so much for your, your words. I really do um, have listened to your example. You've made some great friends in Houston, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, Mr. Louis Yi, of course, is the uh, U.S. Army Air Force, uh, and you were so kind to him as well. It's not, it's not by chance that most of our panelists are, are from the Army. We have one Air Force, and of course, we'll have one Navy that I'll introduce in just a second. But th the statistics actually show that of the World War II veterans we have, 70 percent joined the Army or Army Air Force at the time they were together. And it's not unusual for us to also look later on in life and as we see the people who are enlisting or joining the Navy, uh, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and even Merchant Marines today, there's, there's a smaller number in each one of those branches. But today's representative from the Navy, Rear Admiral Jonathan Yuen, is U.S. Navy retired. Now, John's naval career kind of reminds me of radar on MASH. He was the guy who was entrusted with every detail and who could find anything anywhere at any time during the Korean War. Well, John served in the U.S. Navy Supply Corps for 35 years after graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy. He retired after leading the 47th Chief of Supply Corps and commander of the Naval Supply Systems C Command for five years. He oversaw over 110 worldwide logistics facilities, a team of 28,000 military and civilian professionals, and $33 billion in managed inventory. I mean, that's a lot of toilet paper, John. I can tell you that right now. So, but John, thank you so much for your service as well. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about servant's heart, bedside manner, and the Socratic, Socratic mindset, Socratic mindset, sorry. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ed. Um, so thanks for this opportunity to share my experience as a Chinese American veteran. Uh, I have a, a collage of my life that I'd love to show if you could Pop that up for me, Melanie. Thanks. So um, while growing up in San Francisco, I remember looking at photos of four of my uncles who were in their army and merchant marine uniforms from serving with what I now know as 20,000 other proud Chinese American veterans of World War II. And I have to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulders of these patriots. 
The story that I get to share today is because of these patriots who fought for rights not afforded to them at that time. And for many of them, America was not a country of their birth, but it was and continues to be the country of their choice. Um, when I was growing up in San Francisco, I remember I was always envious of all my classmates uh, who could weave their family tree stories about being one eighth of this, a quarter of that, half of this, um, and their trees, their family trees were very broad leafed and had very deep roots. Um, growing up, my tree was kind of, uh, I thought was boring. I, it was more of a, a bamboo stalk. And, and this bamboo stalk of my family tree in the 1960s wasn't very diverse. But now my life's experiences have given me some diversity to use in my work life today. And, and I'd like to share that. And, and I look back at my bamboo as it was growing. My mom, my dad, my grandparents, they raised me in an era of assimilation. My mom and dad didn't teach me or require my sister or me to learn or speak Chinese in the home. And, and it's actually, you know, the gift of, of the generations of our ancestors, Asians and non-Asian Americans that gave us the threads of our assimilated tapestry. And over my military career, I've had some great experiences that have made me appreciate my Americanism even more. So growing up in San Francisco, um, for those who are from San Francisco, you can see my grandfather was and my mother were raised on Powell Street. There's a picture of, 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 a, of their house there. Uh, I grew up in the city, um, in the city of, uh, my mom and dad made me, or made me, um, helped me uh, through my, my Eagle Scout uh, achievements. And I remember going to um, Stanford football games, home games, because my dad, who was a product of uh, being a draftee in the Korean War and serving, uh, using his uh, GI Bill to get his doctorate at Stanford. And so he was proud of that. And we always would go to home games. And I remember, in fact, in the 70s, attending one of these games where West Point played Stanford. And I remember making a comment to my dad, who are these guys with these short haircuts and laughing about that? And my dad said, uh, you know, don't laugh at that. Um, Someday that could be you. And who thought? Who would have thought that, yeah, a couple of years later, I would actually have the opportunity to go to the Naval Academy. Um, one of the interesting things about my Naval Academy career was that in my junior year, my first semester, I was an exchange student and got to go to West Point. Um, so that was pretty exciting. So I spent my junior year there. Um, if you walk around my, my collage, I, uh, I got to serve on board three different ships. On my very first ship, the USS Narwhal, um, during an ORSE inspection, which is an operational reactor safety exam, which is probably the most important inspection for the commanding officer and the crew. It's a very stressful experience. Well, one night at dinner during this inspection, probably between the please pass the peas and, and the mashed potatoes, the senior ORSE inspector asked me, John, if we were to go to war with China, what would you do? And before I could even answer that question, my CO, my commanding officer, jumped in and told the inspector that his question was inappropriate and for me not to answer that question. I was absolutely stunned. I think the ORSE inspector was, in, was stunned. And at the end of the week, I think my CO was stunned that we still passed our exam. But as a junior officer back then, my bamboo core grew stronger from that tour because of that great leadership from my commanding officer. And I thought I was gonna just do, you know, five years and do my service and, and get out. But it was because of leaders like then uh, Commander Mal Fages, who ended up retiring as a vice admiral that kept me in and I served on board USS Constellation and USS Nassau later on. And the Navy invested in me and grew my mind by sending me to the Wharton School of Business to get my MBA and a bunch of other schools that are listed there. 
And I got to serve in many places and serve with many leaders like Malphages. One of them, um, or I guess two of them really would be, you'll hear their stories next, KK and Susie, who were also in Iraq and Afghanistan and served over in the Middle East. I had the pleasure of serving two tours over there in the Middle East. And there's a picture in the top right-hand corner of me in Afa Palace in what I would call the front row seat of future History Channel episodes. I got the opportunity to serve with the gods and generals of that era. These folks who were making decisions for our young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and they taught me about leadership. I was not Chamberlain uh, at Gettysburg, but I did get a chance to watch great decisions made. And so one of the things I did learn from my leaders was what's in the middle of this picture up above of the Socrates there in a, in a, in a, uh, a surgeon's coat or a doctor's coat and a little heart there. And those are things that Ed were talking about what I think are important for leadership. Servant's heart, not servant leadership. We see a lot of folks writing books about servant leadership. I'm talking about servant's heart, about being about mission, about being about others, about being about nothing but the team, not self, serving others. And then bedside manner. How do you treat others? How do you, how do you lead others? So like a, an oncologist, like a doctor, what is your bedside manner like? I'm not telling you you have to be a wimp in your leadership, but do it with care, do it with love. Are you attacking the patient or are you attacking the cancers? So like a good oncologist, how do you lead others and how do you heal people? And then always, I had bosses who always wanted us to ask why to have a great Socratic mindset, to always challenge the status quo. And you could say, well, how do you do that as a junior person? I had some great leaders who taught me that good answers, great answers come from everywhere, not anywhere, but everywhere. And that's what we needed to, to, to put together is that um, everyone can talk about that. So what is it that I care about? And in the center of my picture, is my family. And so I really just want them to live like the poem Evictus says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my, of my soul. I want them to have the comfort to always answer that they are proudly American. I wish that their bamboo would be very strong, strong enough to bend, but not to break and to be well rooted, that they won't care when people ask, or question them where they're from. They know where they're from, they're Navy brats. They've traveled and lived in many places, but like our, our veterans of World War II, they're proudly American. I'd like to end with a quote that I think is probably apropos as we celebrate the veterans of World War II and all veterans. John Quincy Adams said, I am a warrior so that my son may be a merchant so that his son may be a poet, so we can live the American dream. Thank you. Yeah, you're muted. Thank you, John. Appreciate your message very much. And I just want to acknowledge uh, John's leadership as well in uh, working through the uh, presentations and the ceremonies that we'll be having in Northern California. So thank you so much, John. And thank you for your message about being a servant's heart. I was just saying that all of us who, uh, whether you're civilian or in the military, we, we should have a servant's heart toward fellow man. Well, in case you haven't noticed, Major General Suzanne Varis Lum happens to be the only female on our panel. We just need a few more in the future. And this is where I think, I think Major Susie is going to give us a real uh, insight into how she has gone through uh, the opportunities, trying to turn her challenges, her personal challenge of, of trying to thrive and survive in the military into opportunities she has today. She just came back from a virtual 
trip to Washington, D.C. to be at the Apex Peak Palm Military Luncheon. So she is, she is really tired. No, she's not. She's, re she's really ready to, to give us her examples because she's getting ready to retire at the end of the month. And so I hope, Susie, you're not going to be guarded by what you say. You won't lose your pension, I'm sure. But after 34 years, she is a, a distinguished military graduate at the University of Hawaii Army ROTC program is commissioned into the Military Intelligence Corporate Corps. Uh, she's now acting as, well, at the, in the J-5 Mobilization Assistant to the Director of Plans and Policy. Uh, Susie, I am so looking forward to hearing your comments. You know, um, I've, I've, I've talked about the people I've listened to for the last three or four years who have been in the military. I'm certainly looking forward to looking forward to your comments as well. So you're the only member, I think, that is, is the, you are the walking United Nations as far as a diverse background in what you have. So Susie, thank you so much for being here with us all years. Aloha and mahalo nui, Ed. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to share uh, with all of our distinguished panelists and of course, all of our honoring our World War II Chinese American veterans. You know, after hearing uh, Lieutenant Art Shack and our panelists, I'm already thoroughly inspired. So coming on the back end of these amazing presentations, it's overwhelming, but with every challenge, there's an opportunity. And after hearing Major General Bill Chin and Major General Bob Lee, you know, I had to alter my initial statement. I, I have to say that I'm a U.S. Army general officer and soldier first, who happens to be an Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and who happens to be a female general officer. So thank you for reminding me that we are soldiers and officers first. You know, I've always, like all of our panelists, been inspired by the art shacks and the World War II veterans, especially our Chinese American vet veterans who face challenges with this spirit of perseverance and determination. During World War II, you know, fighting a war abroad, as we heard from art, was tough enough, but fighting discrimination and prejudice while proving your loyalty, when you hear John's question, that those questions that are asked, John, you know, uh, you know, having to defend your loyalty, you know, creates compounding challenges. And our World War II veterans' ability not only to rise above that prejudice and serve our nation with valor and distinguished service, and then come home and contribute to our communities, making it better for the next generation, is, again, nothing short of inspiring. You know, it's the Chinese American example and those of other I'd say marginalized men and women, such as the Nisei veterans, as General Bob Lee mentioned, the Filipino Americans, the African Americans, the Native Hawaiian, the Native, Native Americans, and we could go on and on. Those groups have inspired me throughout my 34 year career in the military. Their examples demonstrated that it is possible for us to turn those challenges into opportunities. As mentioned, I recently am retiring after 34 years of serving in all three components of the Army, and components I mean active duty, the reserves, and the National Guard as a Major General. I know that I, I wouldn't be standing in this position if I didn't look to those who came before me, who set that example that we're talking about today. And especially someone like me who grew up in a small Hawaii town in Wahiwa and entered the Army Reserve as a private first class with a non-typical, as it was mentioned, senior leader background, given my ethnic heritage. So my dad is Hawaiian Chinese, you know, Hawaiian Chinese combination in Hawaii is not unusual. So many of the Chinese immigrants who came to Hawaii, they integrated very quickly into um, the Hawaiian community. So many people who are Hawaiian are Chinese as well. Also he's Portuguese, English, Tahitian, and my mom is from Japan. So. That's really the number one non-typical senior leader background in our nation's military today. And the second thing is my socioeconomic background. You know, I came from a family who knew when it was payday. So it was uh, tough growing up. And number three, I'm a female in a male dominated profession. So those are the three areas that make me non-typical or as I said yesterday, unlikely major general. Some may have, and I know I did, view my life circumstances as, quote, challenges. Poor thing, it's going to be hard. Or, you know, we say poor thing in Hawaii. When I looked at the hard lives of those before me, that changed my perspective. To be able to keep going and believing that I could make a difference in an area that I'm passionate about, and that service to our country and being part of that service. I always relish the stories of World War II as my father, a Vietnam veteran, always controlled the TV, three channels on the TV. We'd watch war movies, 
he'd read books about famous battles in the Pacific and the European theater. But you know, the funny thing is that in most of those movies and documentaries and books, there wasn't much seen or written about Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. So consequently, I would hunt for these stories, the art shack stories, and look for those who rose above the stereotypes and biases and the boxes that people put others in. But thankfully, due to the many great leaders and the men who I've worked for, and two of them are on this line, Major General Lee and Major General Wong, were who I consider um, inspirational as well as enlightened men who can see beyond the surface of people. And yes, before and after that, they've all been men that I've worked for. As well, it, you know, I've also been inspired by those example of the World War II veterans, like our Chinese American veterans, who were able to transform these challenges into opportunities. And in the past five and a half years, I was able to work in the most consequential region, the Indo-Pacific Command, the largest and oldest combatant command, with over 377,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen. I know that sounds like an ad, but I'm really excited to have work there. I've advised the most senior leaders on matters that deal with our nation's top security challenges the People's Republic of China or the Chinese Communist Party. And I make a distinction there, not the Chinese people, but the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China. Russia, DPRK or North Korea, violent extremism and as well as natural disasters. In this role, I dealt with 36 nations across 14 time zones in the Indo-Pacific region. So before I even began working as a one-star general at Indo-Pacific Command or at that time Pacific Command, as a mobilization assistant or deputy to the director of plans and policy. I was the first female on that job. So someone told me, I'm not sure how you'll do because you're a female. And I'm not sure, and someone, not a lot, one person did say to me, sort of like that question that John brought up, how will people view you as you're working through the region and you kind of look like them? Would they perceive you as American? So I'm proud to announce that what was perceived as a challenge by a few was really not. The fact is that I engaged with so many countries as many of you on the line here have, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Bangladesh, Timor-Leste, Malaysia, Singapore, Sri Lanka, M Mongolia, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, India, and even the People's Republic of China. What was amazing is that during these military to military engagements, the flag on my shoulder or the one that sits behind me and being a US Army officer, was not dismissed. But all of the men, and yes, I say men, most of the men, our leaders in the Asia Pacific are men. And I engaged on, a bi on bilateral dialogues and they gave me the respect of a US Army officer. So I felt also that it was helpful to be from this region and understand the diverse culture and language from the host country's perspective. And I found it as a strength, an opportunity to open doors and have what I felt were frank and honest discussions. So while at Indo-Pacific Command, you know, our US forces operate in the air, land, and sea around this vast Pacific and Indian oceans. And a great appreciation, John, for our, our Navy brothers and sisters. And one of the ships that ensures that we have a free and open Indo-Pacific is the USS Chung Hun. I would always watch it. You know, we have a common operating picture and track it with the many vessels traversing through international waters. And there's a lot. I would enjoy asking people, especially our naval officers, John, uh, if they knew who the Arleigh Burke class Aegis destroyer was named after. And surprisingly, or maybe not, some knew and some did not. For those who did not, of course, I wouldn't miss an opportunity to educate. I would say, well, let me tell you, it's named in the honor of Rear Admiral Gordon Paea Chung Hoon. Being Chinese and Native Hawaiian, he is the first Asian American and Native Hawaiian Admiral in the U.S. Navy. So proud. During World War II, while in command of the destroyer USS Sigsby, after a kamikaze crash into the ship and it was badly damaged, commander at that time, Chung Hoon, made key, decision to, to, key decisions to save lives. And for his actions, he received the Navy Cross and Silver Star for his gallantry and extraordinary heroism. So he really turned this challenge into an opportunity to make a difference. It was a selfless opportunity, not a selfish opportunity, to change the course of the lives of the sailors on that ship that day. And to this day, 
the ship's motto is Imua e Kakoa Kai, Imua e Kakoa Kai, Go Forward Sea Warriors. His legacy continues to inspire those sailors on long deployments every day today. And his story inspires me, and I'm committed to sharing it as long as it continues to remind people that in the midst of challenges are opportunities to do great things for others. So mahalo nui loa for this opportunity to join you all today. Aloha. Thank you so much, Susie. I have all have just in the past 24, 48 hours that I've listened to you now twice. It's just it's an amazing story for us as Chinese Americans and those of us who have uh, you know, daughters who might be thinking of that or, or nieces uh, who think of this as a career for them. I, I really think this is something that uh, anyone can embrace. And I think we don't have enough uh, Chinese Americans today who are serving. So so I think we we need to up that percentage. And I think this is a, such a wonderful opportunity for all of you to give your stories and how you advanced and actually advanced the cause of humankind in showing that Chinese Americans are patriotic and loyal to this country. Thank you so much again, Susie. Appreciate your comments. I think it's interesting I get to talk about KK Chen right now because, you know, he talks about relationships, trust, and family. And I said, when you serve in the military, then as a World War II veteran, and of course today, your family is also signed up for this gig, right? <laughs> they don't get a choice out of it. And so I thought about myself and I said, or all of us who are her descendants of World War II veterans, I said, when, you're, when they left the military, you either had a laundry, a grocery store, or a restaurant. So guess what? If that was your dad and mother's life's work, guess what your life's work was for the next 18 years? So, so in terms of that being the way that it was, if you signed up for the military, you know, bless, bless your spouses, your significant other, and bless your children, because they're the ones that, that will support you, and you need their support as well. Well, KK lives in Hawaii with his wife, Val. They have two children, Ashley, an Army uh, doctor, and also Jared, who's aspiring to be like Shaq. He went like Art Shack to be a PGA golfer. He's a 1981 West Point graduate. And the one distinct thing I'll say about KK is he is an Army Ranger. So those are the, I won't say they're the toughest dudes, but they, they like to say they are, okay? So let's just give, give KK that benefit of the doubt and say, okay, we agree with you today for the next 15, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, KK. You've had two combat parachute jumps in Grenada and Panama and combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, as, as Susie had mentioned as well. You've been responsible for being commanding general in the, for the Army South, and that's responsible for 31 countries in Central and South America. And, and, and just as Susie was pointing out, you guys are all over the place. Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, everywhere. And without a joint operations, we would not be as successful as a country as we are today. KK, I look forward to hearing you talk about relationships, trust, and your family. Okay, well, uh, aloha, everyone. Um... I'm really grateful for this opportunity uh, provided by CACA, Melanie and Ed, and, and along with uh, Generals Bill Chen and Bob Lee, thanks. And, and all I can really say is, wow, what, what a great learning and growing opportunity this panel or, or Zoom call has been uh, for all of us. I think as I reflect uh, on the past hour, I think it's worth uh, asking the question, do we see things as they are or do we see them as we are? So do we see things as they are, or do we see them as we are? As all of us are, are lifelong learners, I think we always ask, like Admiral Ewan asks, why do things happen? And as we learn, how, are, how have our perspectives changed? And in the case of uh, today's webinar, you know, Arthur Schack continues to help me better understand the magnitude of the World War II Chinese American veterans contributions to our country and to better appreciate all they did leading the way for future gen generations who continued their uh, legacy of patriotism and leading from the front. As we've heard from uh, General Chen, Lee, Wong, Gerslam, and, and Admiral Yoon. So let me see if I can provide a, a few uh, closing thoughts on trust, relationships, and family. I get asked this question a lot. What person of sound mind and body would jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Would you? Would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? I can tell you I personally wondered that about 175 times in my Army career. And not only did I jump from that perfectly good airplane, 
but twice in the combat operations. In one case, just before 1 a.m. in Panama, after flying over the Panamanian military headquarters, La Comandancia, and seeing it on fire from the open door of the plane. The other was early morning in Grenada with people on the ground shooting at us. Pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> so, so again, why would you do it? I guess we should start off with who's packing your parachute? First, I trust in God for in those four seconds after you jump out of that plane and before that parachute opens, you're truly in God's hands. But you should probably also ask who physically packed your parachute because it has to open for you to live. Who did you trust with your life? I always make an effort to thank the parachute packers or the riggers as we call them. They pack about 20 to 30 parachutes a day and that's the most they can pack in a day due to safety regulations. It's really a thankless job. Day after day, that's all they do. And if it's not, not for them, I wouldn't be here today. So I'd ask you, have you thanked those who have helped you get where you are today? Who packed your parachute? How about our Chinese World War II American uh, veterans? Clearly they packed our parachutes based on all I've heard today and, and your family, your friends, they've helped pack it. Um, if you haven't thanked them recently, I'd ask you to do that right after we finish this webinar. You know, make their day. Think about that. You know, how, how much would you appreciate a call from someone that you, that you know? But then again, let's think about jumping out of that airplane again, that perfectly good airplane. You know, and, and why would you do it? And I think just like in life, like the Army, no one goes it alone. We're part of a team. We're part of a family. We trust each other. In the Army, our life kind of depends on our Ranger or our Army buddy who's on our left or our right in an ambush or a firefight. So just think about it. If bad people are shooting at your buddies and you, then how do you survive? You better shoot back so they can't see where they're shooting and your buddy can move out of harm's way. And then he needs, needs to do the same for you so you can move to positions of advantage to stop these bad people trying to do harm to you and your friends, your army family. You build relationships with your buddies, training together, doing things both personally and professionally together. So you're indeed a family and you have a special bond. So you jump out of this perfectly good airplane to get shot at because your friends are going into harm's way and they're counting on you to be there on their left or right. That's what friends and family do because of, their, of this special relationship that you have. You know, they trust, they, you know, they trust each other with their life, right? and we do. Because in the end, that's, that's who we fight for when the bullets start flying. We're fighting for each other. So think about that. What special relationship have you had or have? And how are you nurturing that relationship today and building trust so that they know they can count on you when their life depends on it? Make a difference in someone's life because you'll never know how that smile or that kind word may be all it took to turn around around a life or, or really save a life. So we jump out of that perfectly good airplane because we trust the parachute packer. We've got relationships with everyone jumping out of that perfectly good airplane. So, so please kind of tell me that, that there's a little more to it. And, and there is, um, you know, it's family. You do things to make the world a better place for your children so that they can be successful and live a better life than you. I think we all appreciate the sacrifices the World War II Chinese American uh, veterans made for us because they truly led the way. You know, General Odierno, a former Army Chief of Staff, said it best, the strength of our nation is our Army, the strength of our Army is our soldiers, and the strength of our soldiers is our families. I, I think as we look back, back and now see things as they are, versus as we are, or should I say that we were, uh, that we really did not understand growing up the magnitude of the sacrifices and services, service with honor by our grandparents, by our parents, our aunts, and our uncles. We should also realize 
that our Chinese American World War II veterans lived life to its fullest, and they made a difference for future generations. They wrote a life story they could be proud of, and in a perfect world, they told their grandchildren. It's up to you to never forget and pass on their legacy and continue to write your life story that you can be proud of and tell your grandchildren. My last thought would be like Bill Chen did with Unsung Heroes, start writing. Unless you want to be reduced to a gravestone and a listing on someone's genealogical chart and nothing more than start writing. You know, write, write stories to pass on to the family. Make a difference. And if your parents, grandparents, and others do not leave stories, then you be the first one to leave stories in both audio and video. I encourage you, like Art Shack said earlier, just do it. In closing, I, I think, think about who's packing your parachute. And, and first, be thankful to God for without him, we wouldn't be here today. Be, and be thankful to all of our World War II Chinese American veterans who set us up for success. And be thankful for all the relationships that you've built in your lifetime and will continue to build as none of us can do this alone. It's all about our teammates and our friends who help us through good times and hard times. And also be thankful to your family because your family is your strength. To everyone who's been on this webinar today, thanks for packing my parachute today and by listening. Thanks CACA for hosting and God bless the USA, our military in harm's way and each of you. Thank you very much.